right, uh, 7 o'clock, please, if you would, uh, turn your Bibles, have a seat, turn your Bibles to Exodus chapter 32. We're going to finish the second half of uh, what we started last week, Exodus chapter 32, and uh, let's go ahead and begin with a word of prayer, but we will be on the second half of Exodus 32 when we do get started. Here, let me turn off my phone, and we are good to go. Let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we come before you uh, humbly. We come before you seeking your face. Lord, we ask that uh, you would speak to us. And so we expect, as you've said you would, that you would speak to your people through your word. And so give us light, give us understanding, give us your truth, that we might uh, make decisions that glorify you, that please you in our lives. Lord, we think of our our teenagers, we think of our children and the volunteers that help with both, that uh, you'd bless them. Bless the work of the ministry in their lives as uh, they interact, as they uh, are examples one to another, as they teach Scripture, as they live out the truth before uh, each other as well. Help them to be examples and help them to be good instructors. Help us to be good students as we uh, seek your face this evening. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Exodus chapter 32. This is Israel's idolatry and Moses' intercession, part two. Uh, We started last week. Um, Just a review before we begin in verse 15. Remember Israel, uh, they're they're at uh, the mountain, the holy mountain. Moses is up in the the mountain, Mount Sinai. The people pressured Aaron to make a a god, uh, an image. So they, they constructed a golden calf. Uh, they worshipped it. They indulged themselves in uh, pagan uh, revelry. Um, they were um, like the nations around them. And Moses calls it a great thing that they did, a great sin. Okay, You'll see it like three or four times in this chapter. This great sin, this great sin, this great sin. It, it wasn't just idolatry. It was the breaking of a covenant. They knew what the covenant was and they broke it. And this is a great sin, and so there has to be some consequences. And so we'll see Moses' attempt at discipline in verses 15 to 29. So let's go ahead and uh, begin in Exodus 32, verse 15, and we'll read to verse 18. And Moses turned and went down from the mount, and the two tables of the testimony were in his hand. The tables were written on both their sides, on the one side and on the other were they written. And the tables were the work of God, and the writing was the writing of God, graven upon the tables. And when Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said unto Moses, There is a noise of war in the camp. And he said, It is not the voice of them that shout for mastery or victory, neither is is it the voice of them that cry for being overcome, but the noise of them that sing Do I hear? So as he's coming down the mountain, leadership, remember eventually Joshua would take over. Joshua would be handed the baton. He's being mentored. He's being trained. Moses asks him to come down. And as you can tell, experience level, right? Joshua hears war. Moses hears playing. So experience came into play there. And so he's teaching. Okay, eventually Joshua's going to take the lead. He's going to take the reins. And Moses is training even here, mentoring him. Come down, right? Uh, Verse 19. And it came to pass, as soon as he came nigh into the camp, that he saw the calf in the dancing. And Moses' anger waxed hot. And he cast the tables out of his hands and brake them beneath the mount. And he took the calf which they had made and burnt it in the fire and ground it into powder and strawed it upon the water and made the children of Israel drink of it. And Moses said unto Aaron, What did this people do unto thee that thou hast brought so great a sin upon them? And Aaron said, Let not the anger of my Lord wax hot. Thou knowest the people, that they are set on mischief. And so let's just make some comments here. Moses is angry. I mean, it it waxed hot. It says twice there. It was an anger that is tempered by love, right? You know, you're angry because you love the people. They're hurting themselves. And the guy you put in charge of them allowed it to happen. So he's angry. He's in anguish. Okay, anger 
tempered by love here. And um, he breaks the, 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 the tablets of stone containing the Ten Commandments here. He melts down. Remember the golden calf? It was just layered with gold. Underneath was wooden. So he burns it, gathers the powdered up uh, uh, gold. And uh, if you read Deuteronomy 9.21, there's a, there's a river that, or a stream that comes out. And so he throws the, throws the ashes, the powder into the water. And he makes the people drink of it. That may have happened later. I think this is a commentary on just what he did with it. So you can follow the, the line of thought here. So doing this, right, he makes them drink of it. He totally destroys the idol. He, um, he, he, he's forcing the people as they drink in what they worshipped, right? He's forcing them to identify with the sin that they've committed. And then, you know, the breaking of the Ten Commandments itself or the, the two tablets of stone containing the Ten Commandments was a symbolic act, right? He, they had broken the covenant, and here's the written contract. He had broken it. This was a great sin. This was a serious matter. It's not just worshiping idols, but this was a breaking of the, the, the contract, the covenant that God had made. So Moses is angry here. And before he uh, addresses the people again, he holds leadership accountable. He talks with his brother, right? As we see here that um, personally, I think Aaron is a good team player, just not a good leader. He just let the people push him around, and he offers lame excuses here and there. It's, it's almost laughable if it weren't so sad. And so before he deals with the people, he confronts the leadership. Why? Because the privilege of leadership brings with the responsibility and accountability. And part of leadership, if you're a parent, if you're a boss, if you, if you lead in, in, in any type of capacity in your workplace or in the church, part of leadership is to protectively restrain people from doing things that they will harm themselves. That's why businesses have policies. That's why government and families have rules. It is to protect the people inside of the, of the team or the corporation or the family or the nation. And uh, Aaron fails to do so. Okay? We are supposed to, as leaders, restrain the people, the children, or whoever is in, 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 the, in the membership from doing things that will bring harm or judgment upon them for their own good, okay? And what happens? Aaron fails. He brings shame upon the people. We see that. Let's look at verse 23. Remember, he's offering excuses. He's blame shifting. Look at verse 23. For they said unto me, make us gods which shall go before us. For as this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what has become of him. And I said unto them, Whosoever have any gold, let him break it off. So they gave it me. Then I cast it into the fire, and there came out this calf. You know, you're like, wow, that is a miracle, right? I'm like, come on, right? He's uh, blame shifting, excuse making. Doesn't hold any water, though. Verse 25, and when Moses saw that the people were naked, for Aaron had made them naked under their shame among their enemies. So he's, he's, he's allowing them to be just like the pagan nations that they had left and are surrounded by. He rebukes Aaron. So again, the people are here because of his leadership. He addresses him first. Now he's going to talk to the people. Look at verse 26. And here is where the people have a chance to respond. Verse 26. Then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together unto him. So here's an opportunity for all of disobedient, rebellious Israel to turn and respond. It wasn't like they didn't know that what they did was wrong, and it wasn't like they didn't have an invitation to make it right before judgment came, right? So who responds? Uh, Levi's family, the sons of Levi. They gather themselves together unto him. There has to be some type of order restored in the camp. Essentially, a lot of commentators think there was just orgies and dancing going on, okay? It's, it's just pagan uh, for people who have been called out to be lights into the world. They were totally opposite, okay? Verse 27, 
And he said unto them, the, the, the Levites here, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Put every man his sword by his side, and go in and out from gate to gate throughout the camp, and slay every man his brother, and every man his companion, and every man his neighbor. And the children of Levi did according to the word of Moses. And there fell of the people that day about 3,000 men. For Moses had said, Consecrate yourselves today to the Lord, even every man upon his son and upon his brother, that he may bestow upon you a blessing this day. So the seriousness of the transgression, we, we see the seriousness of the transgression. It's reflected in the consequence, death. After he said, who's on the Lord's side? The people just ignore him, or at least 3,000 troublemaking men. And Levi's squad goes out and kills that many. And again, this is after the invitation to, to get right again, right? It wasn't like he just flew off the cuff. These men here, okay, in the New Testament, it'll be reflected this way. Jesus would say it in this way. If any man loves his father and his mother more than me, he's not worthy of me. So these men here did not count family ties stronger than their relationship with God. Okay, and, you know, strap your sword on your side and go kill every man who hasn't repented. And 3,000 men were ki killed, probably the primary troublemakers. Now let's look at verse 30. And it came to pass in the morrow that Moses said unto the people, Ye have sinned a great sin. There's that word again, great sin. And now I will go up unto the Lord, peradventure, I shall make an atonement for your sin. And Moses returned unto the Lord and said, Oh, this people have sinned a great sin and have made them gods of gold. Yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sin, and if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book which thou hast written. And the Lord said unto Moses, Whosoever hath sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. Therefore now go, lead the people unto the place which I have spoken unto thee. Behold, mine angel shall go before thee. Nevertheless, in the day when I visit, I will visit their sin upon them. And the Lord plagued the people because they made the calf which Aaron made. So Aaron made it, they made it. They're accountable too. Now here we see Moses interceding for the people again. We saw that in verses 9 to 14 of this very same chapter. But here he goes back up to Mount Sinai. He spends another 40 days and 40 nights up there before getting the Ten Commandments. He's fasting, he's praying for his people. And we just read that he said, hey, kill me. Lot my name out. Just kill me. Okay, and the, the, the historical context of that statement was this. Um, cities kept a log, of, a registration of all the people that were alive in their city, living people. And when they died, they took their names off. Right? It was a running census. Kill me. Take my name out. Right? That's the picture here. But we see here Moses trying to make atonement for the people. Here's a Christ-like picture, right? This is, this is a good example, a Christ-like picture, but guess what? God rejects it out of hand. He doesn't accept Moses' attempt to be an atonement. And he gives us a principle which is very solemn, very, very uh, sobering. Verse 33, if you want to just look at that again. And the Lord said unto Moses, Whosoever, this is after he says, blot my name out, I'm, let me take their place, right? He says, blot my name out, and God says in verse 33, Whosoever has sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. Okay. Whoever sinned is going to be accountable and responsible for his own sin. You did the crime. You're going to pay the time. Even though 3,000 men died, their deaths did not atone for the sins of the people because each man 
Each individual will bear the punishment for their own sin. <clears throat> and just to underline this truth, we see verse 35, right? And the Lord plagued the people. So now here's their punishment. They're going to receive the plague. Even in the midst of God judging his own, God gives some assurance to Moses, verse 34. Therefore now go lead the people into the place where I have spoken unto thee. Behold, my angel shall go before you. Okay, so he still assures Moses, look, I'm not going to accept your atoning desire. People are going to be punished. Okay, when I do punishment, punish them, they're going to have the plague. They're going to experience the plague. So verse 35, he plagued the pe people. So here's God's grace. It's manifested in his love, right? He chastens, he scourges, he spanks those he loves. We see that Hebrews 12, verses 5 through 11, right? So as we just wrap this up, it's a shorter, shorter chapter, but the three big ideas here that we get from these uh, 15, 25 verses here. Number one, God disciplines those he loves. Disobedience may not get the full end of God's wrath, but at the same time, sin will not be excused. Love and grace will discipline it's that simple. He, he loves his own, and so he's going to punish his own. God disciplines those he loves. That's the big idea that uh, one of the things that we need to get out of this, this last half of ch chapter 32. God disciplines those he loves. Second big idea. I think Moses is still an example, even though God didn't say yes, right? Moses intercedes for rebellious people. How can we apply that tonight in prayer? How many rebellious people do you know? Children, grandchildren, neighbors, co-workers, colleagues. How many rebellious people you know? Probably a lot. Let's pray. Let's pray tonight. Let's intercede on behalf of rebellious people. Ask God to reveal himself to them. That they might have a right relationship with him. All the rebellious people, you know, right? And you don't have to go far to find out. <laughs> let's ask God today, let's intercede on behalf of rebellious people to, to, for God to reveal himself to them through whatever means necessary, right? That could be punishment. That could be just uh, hun honey. You know, here, God can comfort you in your sin if you repent, right? If you repent, he'll, he'll give you comfort. You know, a broken and contrite heart, I'll not despise, God says. And then God can also send a storm, just like it with Jonah. A storm of correction. You're going the wrong direction, I'm going to throw a storm in your life, so you might go the right direction. So let's pray that for rebellious people tonight. And then lastly here, so third big idea, let's guard against idolatry and rebellion, because it's easy. Uh, let's have the same attitude as the psalmist in uh, Psalms 97.10. They who love the Lord hate evil. Now, if you see in this story in Exodus 32 here, in God's grace, he forgives the sinner, right? He forgives, but in his government, he punishes the sinner. He punishes his own. He must punish the sin. It may seem cruel to us, but look what happened, right? The people already knew, don't make any graven images. They were worshiping the right God in the wrong way. That happens a ton today still, right? But they were worshiping the right God in the wrong way. They were willfully disobeying, and God sent the plague. So let's, let's guard against idolatry and rebellion. Um, remember, th these people of his were to be separate from the world. They were to be light unto the Gentiles. And they weren't. They did exactly what the other pagan nations did, and God chastened them. Another application from this, right? Remember that all of us, in his, in his grace, he forgives sin, but in his government, he still spanks his own children, right? 
this principle, verse 33, right? He goes, uh, even though Moses pleads for them, he says, uh, God responds, whosoever has sinned against me, I'm going to blot out of my book. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kill him. Or I'm going to judge him one way or another. Ecclesiastes 12, 14. Okay, it, it, the, the wise preacher of Ecclesiastes, listen to this. God shall bring every work into judgment, whether every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. So no one's going to get away with sin. Even though God's forgiving, there's still going to be punishment for it. Matthew 12, 36. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give an account thereof on the day of judgment. So praise the Lord that God has taken our judgment because of Jesus. But on the earth, if we're his children, he'll still spank us to make us, make us obedient, to get us back right. In fact, turn to 1 Corinthians, and we'll close here. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, the Apostle Paul looks back on, on Israel's history here, and you'll, we'll highlight it, and he'll say, this is what we need to learn from it. Okay? 1 Corinthians chapter 10, beginning in verse 1. The Apostle Paul says, Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. So we already read about that, right? The Red Sea. And were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and did all eat the same spiritual meat, and did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples, to the intent we should not lust after evil things, as they also lusted. Neither be ye idolaters as some of them, as it is written, here's our text, right? The people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happened unto them for examples. And they are written for our admonition, our warning, our instruction upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he stand take heed lest he fall. So let's guard against idolatry here because we know God punishes his own and we, we read about it with Moses and we'll continue to read about it in the next few, few uh, next chapter and then the next book of the Bible as well. All right, any questions or comments on Exodus 32? Paul? Right, right. And remember what chastening is, spanking is supposed to do? Produce the peaceable fruit, fruit of repentance and peace, right? And it, and it did produce that, at least with some. Okay, any other questions or comments here? Right, uh, everything, you know, everything that we read about, the principles taught in the New Testament, right? So, all right, uh, let's look at our prayer prompter this evening.